So hello everyone and thank you for joining the Solar Soil Association Food for Life's hospital webinar, webinar on understanding and reducing food waste. My name is Susanna McWilliam and I'm the program manager of our Food for Life Hospitals program and I'm delighted also that Tracy Hugel, Head of Dietetics and Orthotics from East Lancashire Hospitals NHS Trust is going to be joining us today. Food for Life and East Lancs have been working together on food waste and Tracy will be sharing the outcomes of some of this work which has resulted in the launch of the Malnutrition Prevention Program in October. So just a few technical details from today. We're going to be recording the webinar, so we've set everyone's microphone to mute at your end. And um, Please also use the chat function and you can access that through the icon on the left hand side of your screen. If you are listening live today, you can click on the top right hand side. There's a little square box with a picture of a person in it. And if you go on there and select the presentation uh, view, you'll be able to make the most of today's slides. If there are any difficulties um, with hearing today, we're going to be recording their webinar, so you'll be able to pick it up and listen to it afterwards if you have any technical problems at your end. So on today's webinar, we're going to be focusing on ward level food waste. And we all know that production and kitchen waste is really important in trusts, but actually it's those practices at ward level that can be particularly complex to address. So by raising awareness of the causes of food waste at ward level, and by implementing changes, that can bring multiple benefits to trusts and of course to your patients too. So in today's webinar we're going to be looking at some of the evidence. So that's evidence from a number of academic studies that we'll be sharing. We'll also be looking at some of the national data sets, particularly from England, although there are data sets available in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales as well. We'll be looking at some audit date details from a couple of case studies and then we'll be unpacking three of the key reasons why food waste really matters. Then we'll be sharing more about our support and the benefits it can bring to trusts, including the in-depth look at recent work at East Lancashire. In today's webinar, we're really keen to hear from you too and for you to use the chat function. So feel free to ask any questions as we go through today and we'll pick those up towards the end of the session. So it would be great to know who's joined us uh, today, what your background is. So feel free to use the chat function to introduce yourself to the group listening and perhaps include your discipline in there and the organisation that you're from. So a little bit more about Food for Life. Well, for anyone that hasn't come across Food for Life, we're, we're an award-winning UK-wide programme whose mission is to make good food the easy choice for everyone, whoever and wherever they are. And for us, Food for Life defines good food as food which is good for health, also food that's sustainable has high animal welfare standards. But we also really recognise that food is an important social issue and that food provides opportunities to socialise with others. This can be particularly important in hospitals where patients can be particularly isolated, uh, particularly if they stayed in hospital for a long time. So through our work with hospitals, we've worked with around 70 hospitals, trusts and health boards across the UK. And we do this through a series of programmes where we take really a whole settings approach and work across a number of disciplines. We also aim to motivate and celebrate good practice and we do this through our hospitals network or in the process of developing a good food hospitals award. We also do some work with policymakers to ensure a supportive policy context for good food in hospitals. And before we look at how much uh, is wasted from a national perspective and look at some of the evidence, it'd be really great to hear from some of you who have joined us today. So feel free, if you're willing to share, to pop in the chat function, how much food is currently wasted at your trust, if you know how much that is. And really aware that methodologies can differ. So feel free to pop in perhaps the percentage of food that's wasted, or perhaps if you gather it by waste, uh, by weight. And if you're not sure how much food you, um, you're wasting, just feel free to, to pop in a don't know into the chat function. So thanks for that. So how much food is actually wasted nationally and how much was reported last year? Well, in England, food waste is reported by all NHS trusts through something called ERIC, that stands for the Estates Returns Information Collection. Our methodologies have changed over the years and last year all trusts were asked to submit the weight of their unserved meals over the course of one week. So the results are on this slide in the red circle. You can see that over the course of that week, right across England, uh, 1,370,000 kilograms of waste 
text was recorded. I'm multiplying that up over the year, it's around about 7,000 metric tons of food waste. But it's a little bit difficult to put this into perspective as there aren't any baselines yet to kind of measure this against. And there aren't any recorded measurements for the total weight of food that was cooked in the first place. But to help put that in, into perspective from a national scale, for every meal that was ordered, in other words, for the 140 million meals that were ordered across the, across the year, that's around five grams of waste for every meal requested. So I think it's, it's clear to see from these national data sets that this is just the tip of the iceberg of food waste. Well, what do academic studies show us? Well, well, there are a number of different methodologies, and in this on this slide, you can see five different uh, five different studies with different methodologies. So, a couple look at measurements for plate waste. Um, some look at the number of dishes on the menu that waste more than twenty percent. The one fourth dial looks at the nutritional value of uh, the meal that's been lost through plate waste, and the, finally, the last one looks at the, all of the waste. So, that brings together plate and trolley food waste. Well, there's a kind of general consensus, as you can see through the slide, that around 30% uh, of, of food is wasted. So it, it's really different from the scale of, of um, the ERIC data that we saw on the previous slide. So what's going on, sort of despite the different methodologies, why is this really stark difference in figures? Well, on this slide, I'm showing some data I've collected from my own studies, where I looked, um, I spent some time in three hospitals and a health board in Wales, and I looked at the waste that was collected over meal services on these three hospitals across nine wards. As you can see on the left-hand column in the first hospital, altogether actually 59% of all of the food that reached that ward was wasted. In the second hospital, it was 41%. And in the third hospital, it was 29%. So really, really high figures of, of food waste, but you know, not, not unknown in the sector. What was interesting from the findings was what was being recorded by their trust staff themselves on the same days and in the same wards. And that's shown in the red block at the bottom. You can see that only 7% was actually required when the reality was 59% in the first hospital. And the second, it was 14% was recorded. And in the third, it was 11% recorded. So why was there such a discrepancy here? Well, there were there were a number of reasons. So simply, sometimes the the um, the staff were too busy to be able to fill in the recording sheets. Sometimes the methodology they were using was wrong. So for a, when a whole tray of food was wasted, rather than perhaps write eight portions, they just wrote the number one. And in some cases. I think it's fair to say that the hostesses who were recording the waste were worried that they would get into trouble for actually overordering. So they chose to reduce the numbers of food waste, the of numbers of portions of food that had been wasted. They chose to reduce that so that they wouldn't get into trouble. So now that we've explored the scale of food waste, we want to think about well, why does food waste really matter? And why would we want to do something about it? So in the next few slides, we're going to be looking at the economic, environmental, and nutritional implications of food waste. And in this multidisciplinary world of NHS trusts, each of these reasons may resonate for different disciplines. Firstly, looking at the cost of food waste, and I think this is a really big one for many in the, in the sector. In my own study across those nine wards, when we scale that up through the whole trust, um, just over a third of a million pounds worth of uh, money was the amount that was wasted per year across that trust. Figures from RAP here on the screen show that for healthcare food waste, 230 million pounds per year is the cost of waste, um, and that was data from 2013, and that's the equivalent of 22p for every meal that was served. So in the current, under current financial pressures and cost improvement programs, savings to be made from reducing waste speak for themselves. So moving on to the environmental impacts of food waste, well, many NHS trusts take their responsibility towards sustainability very seriously, and the fantastic examples out there of more sustainable procurement practices, also green waste practices. And I think the public are increasingly expecting greener practices from the public sector, including hospitals. And there's a big push at the moment, for example, on reducing single-use plastics. But few are aware of the environmental impacts of the food supply chain. As this slide says, the food system contributes 20 to 30% of man-made greenhouse gas emissions. 
It's also the leading cause of deforestation and biodiversity loss, pollutes soils and water, and accounts for a staggering 70% of all human water use. So wasted food carries a significant environmental burden. I like this slide, uh, this German infographic, because it actually translates the environmental impacts of food waste into more tangible things, such as uh, kilometres driven or agricultural land use in terms of football pitches and agricultural water use in terms of litres. And when you do some scaling up, looking at some of the figures we have from Eric and thinking that the more likely and probable amount of food waste is around 30%, the environmental burden of food waste in English hospitals would be equivalent to roughly driving around the world 150 times, would be equivalent to agricultural land use, uh, 420 football pitches of agricultural land being really used unnecessarily, and a staggering uh, 12 million litres of water being wasted unnecessarily every year. But it's the nutritional implications of food waste that are perhaps most concerning in the NHS, because of course any food that's left uneaten once it's reached the patient, those lost nutrients can really undermine recovery. And the statistics on this slide really speak for themselves. So at the top, as many as a third of all acute admissions, uh, people are actually malnourished when they arrive in hospital. And it's well known that once in hospital, the incidence of malnutrition actually increases. With an ageing population and many more, actually 30% of hospital patients um, having dementia, um, so these 30% of hospital patients with dementia, I should say, are malnourished. There are also implications from malnourishment on readmission rates. So Sharma et al. study has shown that almost four times more likely to be readmitted if you have malnutrition within seven days of discharge. So not only is this going to have a big impact on health and well-being, but also on the financial burden to the NHS. So I think this really shows us that ward level food waste, they're two sides of the same coin, the food eaten and the food that's left uneaten. So looking at this evidence and the impacts and being really clear on the reporting gap, how can Food for Life support your trust and your teams to better understand and reduce food waste. So this really starts at the ward, if you like, on the front line, because crucial to food waste reduction is really ensuring that patients have access to the right amount of good food, and also that patients are eating enough food to support recovery and well-being. So really understanding what's happening at the ward level and engaging your multidisciplinary teams is crucial to reducing and preventing ward level food waste. As this slide from RAP shows, that prevention at the very top of this waste hierarchy is where the greatest savings can be made, as in the environmental and the financial savings. But of course, it's really important that patients still have enough food to support their nutritional needs. And at the bottom of this waste hierarchy, we can see disposal and other forms of recovery. So this is really the, the last option. But yet, yeah, this tends to get the greatest amount of focus within trusts and within sustainability leads is, is the disposal element. So really in focusing on prevention on the top of this waste hierarchy, our support starts on the ward. So a little more about how we actually work with trusts and then we'll take an in-depth look at East Lancashire and the findings and hear more about their current progress. Well, first of all, it's really understanding about where you are with your trust because every trust is really different. You're reporting waste in different ways. Um, perhaps there are gaps in your reporting currently. You'll have different levels of disciplinary engagement and also different food systems in place and different aspirations from the work. So in a scoping call, we really start to understand more about your trust and what your aspirations and the opportunities are. Engaging all is absolutely crucial. So bringing multidisciplinary disciplinary teams together for a workshop that will include catering staff, dietetics, uh, could include also nursing staff and sustainability leads, patient experience leads and more. So in that workshop, we really understand and unpack kind of why food waste is an issue, sharing the kind of slides that we've shared today. But also it's that opportunity for staff to discuss um, what is happening within the trust it's ultimately there on the front line on your awards and can actually come up with some of the best insights and suggestions for making changes. We do a pilot audit and we take a really in-depth look at what's happening on one ward as a kind of way to unpack and understand some of the behaviours and that would be a ward chosen by, by your trust and that will lead to a bespoke food waste report then where we feedback the findings and some additional, additional resources. 
And finally, we work with you on some action planning where we support you to develop a bespoke waste reduction action plan and the costs are on the bottom of the screen. So moving forward onto the next few slides, we want to really look at an example of what, an, what the audit uncovered at East Lancashire to give, give you a bit of an insight into the type of data and information that will come through. So when we worked with East Lancs, they chose Ward BT, which is an acute stroke ward with 24 beds. And it's probably helpful to say that on an acute stroke ward, we would, uh, we would expect to see high levels, higher levels of food waste than you might in others. So the numbers on this ward on that particular day, uh, 24 beds, 21 beds were occupied, eight patients were nil by mouth, 13 evening meals had been ordered that day, and two of the 21 patients were on a food chart. So during the audit, we were really interested in capturing all of the waste data at that meal service. So that was the plate waste and also the unserved waste. We were also interested in understanding how much food <coughs> had been eaten, so that nutritional implication. And we also wanted to understand more about that ward practice. So we collected three main types of data, data how much was served, eaten and wasted per patient, what was left unserved, and also we looked at what was going on during a wood service. So we observed wood service and we also spoke to staff on the day. So when we, when we analysed the data, what did we find? Well, as had been ordered, 13 meals were delivered, but actually uh, only nine patients ended up eating at the evening meal service. So if you take a closer look at this slide, each of the red boxes uh, represents one patient. So you can see the nine patients on here. Within the slide then, there, each of those patients had a, uh, had a starter, which was soup in this case, a main course in the middle, and a pudding. And where the bar is blue, that shows how much the patient has eaten, and where it's red, that shows food that was um, delivered to the patient that was on their tray, um, but what was left uneaten. So although the numbers are relatively small here, we can reach some really meaningful conclusions through this data. So for example, it was clear that three courses were too much uh, for the vast majority of these patients. Only patient number two actually ate all of their three courses, whereas you can see that patients number seven, eight, and nine weren't able to manage their three courses. We can see here in the analysis that two courses tends to work really well. So seven out of nine patients actually ate most or all of their two courses. We can also see that the main course meal was really well received. So most people here, again, ate most or all of their main course. Only patient number seven didn't manage to eat the main course. And, and that was actually because they just didn't like the choice on that day. And we can also see, and it's really important to recognise, that in hospital settings, some food waste is always inevitable because patients may feel unwell at mealtime. And that was the case with patient number four. So we can see from all of the blue bars what, what was eaten, but we can also see from the red bars what wasn't eaten. And this gives, starts to give us some kind of insight into uh, the nutritional vulnerability of certain patients. Next, when we analysed the data, we looked at the unserved meals. So here, the unserved meals show up in the pink wedge on our slides. And the unserved meals were on this ward were, were really high, probably higher than expected. So you can see in the central circle where um, it's the main courses, 43% uh, of all of the main courses sent to this ward were wasted. So 14 were sent, and actually six didn't, didn't reach the patients. So why was so much food actually left uh, unserved in this ward? And here, that's where some of the staff insights were really key. First of all, there are very high levels of patient movement, and that was, uh, that was a common finding on this particular ward. So five patients had actually been discharged or moved before the mealtime. And as the patient orders had been placed the evening before, um, no changes had been made, and these five patients had changed. There was something to you here about like right, the time of day that the audit was done. So staff said that um, there was a much higher turnover of patients, usually before the evening meal, so that the waste levels would always be higher at the evening compared to lunch. As I said before, sickness is absolutely inevitable um, in a hospital setting, so some food waste will always relate back to sickness. 
with new patients coming in and out of hospital, uh, which, which did happen on this ward. Um, choice can be a problem, as, as sometimes, particularly with a plated meal service, as it was in East Lanx, new patients may inherit someone else's choice, and it may not suit their taste. The order also uncovered a bit of an anomaly when it came to desserts. So actually, 16 desserts ended up being um, being sent for the uh, for the 13 patients that had originally had meals ordered for them, and for the nine that ate. What was actually happening here was that um, dietitians were ordering nutritionally dense snacks, for example, wrapped cakes. And at kitchen level, these snacks were being added to the meal trays. So then at mealtime, for example, you may have ended up with two, two puddings. Um, you, you're sort of you're crumble and custard that, uh, that evening, plus a wrapped cake. Um, but ward level staff weren't aware of the fact that one of these is intended to be kind of a nutritionally boosting snack. So consequently, quite a few of these double puddings ended up turned as wasted, although in fact on the audit day, a few, I think prompted by the audit, um, actually held back those snacks for, for later use. So looking overall, when we put all of the data together, our overall waste, well, we've put together what was unserved and also the plate waste. It's clear on this slide, as you can see from the red circles, that over half of the food sent on that day was wasted and less than half of the food sent was eaten. So looking at the kind of recommendations for change then, these, these recommendations, some of, they, some of the recommendations may speak to those who, who are on the line and some would be really bespoke for this situation at East Lanx. Um, some of these recommendations came through as a result of the audit and some from the workshop. So firstly, just really simply on measuring food waste, um, there wasn't a system in practice at ward level at that time. So the recommendation was to put in place or to pilot some uh, food waste auditing at ward level and to move on and set targets in time. Secondly, a really simple change to, to put into place is reducing the waste of sealed food items. So many in our workshops said that when items um, such as yogurts or perhaps wrapped ambient snacks, the cakes, the cheeses, the crackers, came up to ward level, if they'd been sent into the patient but hadn't been touched, they would automatically end up in the bin. So one of the recommendations was to just develop a sort of standardized protocol and a way of working across the whole trust to kind of minimize um, these ending up in the bin and to provide new opportunities for snacks like this to be reused at a later time, just making sure that you were working with infection control um, so, that, uh, so that keeping back just fit within the uh, correct recommendations for infection control. There was something then about introducing some uh, systems changes, opportunities to review on the day ordering for select patient groups, particularly where there was high turnover, and also there's opportunities to review the, how the snack service worked. Quite a few suggested then introducing bespoke portion sizes for select patient groups because there's a real problem identified and, and how, um, how to address best the needs of specific groups. Um, particularly the frail elderly who might have small appetites. So some suggestions came forward about being able to note this on the menu, perhaps on the order of the day that the patient had a small appetite, perhaps that two courses would be suitable for this patient, not the three courses, but also looking to the kitchens to provide smaller but more nutritionally dense main meals. Something came through then on strengthening the organisational culture and ownership of the issue. So people did identify that there was a little more just-in-case ordering than they would have liked, more mealtime interruptions than should have been happening, and some poor communication between the ward and the catering teams. So lots of opportunities for improvement. And last the suggestion on developing and using patient experience feedback more effectively, so for example in a more timely manner and really involving the patient experience team in that. So I hope that by sharing some of the findings from East Lancashire, it's demonstrated the value of this in-depth um, technique to really shine a spotlight on ward level practice. We're starting to uncover the reasons for and some of the solutions to food waste. So for trust, these findings can also really provide uh, independent evidence that can help to unlock wider engagement and start the journey to effectively reduce food waste. And I'd like to pass over to Tracy Hugill who's Head of Dietetics and Orthotics at East Lanx and Head of their Nutrition Steering Group. So Tracy, along with Zach Grayson, Nutrition Advisor for Catering, have been working closely with Food for Life and we ran a pilot of our food waste support at their trust. 
So Tracy today is going to be speaking about the project that has grown out of this work. That's a malnutrition prevention project, which aims to reduce the risk of malnutrition on patients and to reduce food waste as part of that process. So welcome to Tracy. Hello. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. I'm joining you by phone. Um, so if you can't hear me, don't shout at your computer screen, but do use the comment box at the bottom and hopefully Susanna's team will pick that up. Susanna, can you hear me okay? I'm hoping so. Hi, hi Tracy. <laughs> yes, I just muted <laughs> yeah, myself. I can fine. hear you loud and clear. That's Thanks fine. very much, Tracy. So over okay, to you. Thanks. thanks. Um, so, um, as Susanna said, she came into the hospital and did some work, and I thought just to, to set the scene, it, it, it's helpful to um, tell you about uh, East Lancashire hospitals and what we consist of. Um, so, we have five hospitals. There's the Royal Blackburn Hospital, the big site that you can see on the bottom left, and the Burnley General Hospital, our two main sites, and then we have three smaller community sites as well. So, across the five hospitals, we have a total of 700 beds. Um, we're a community and acute, so with about 7,000 staff as well. Um, Susanna did pick up on some of the figures here around malnutrition in hospital, and um, you can see that the 25 to 34 percent of, of patients that are malnourished when they come in and the other figures there that she's run through so I won't repeat. But I think what's really important to, to show is that malnutrition in hospitals is still a very real issue that, that we need to be tackling. In 1860, Florence Nightingale came out with this comment and she, she said that every careful, careful observer of the sick will agree in this that thousands of patients are annually starved in the midst of plenty um, and for lots of different reasons and I don't think things have changed massively. The reasons will have changed and um, we've certainly got lots of surgical and medical developments but um, getting people to eat and stay nourished whilst in hospital is still a challenge for us. Um, you may or uh, be aware, I know we've got a lot of people on this conference from different backgrounds, but um, I just wanted to touch on malnutrition screening. Uh, this is something that is CQC regulated, so all hospitals have to screen patients on admission and every seven days for their risk of malnutrition, and this is what the tool looks like. Um, earlier on this year, we uh, East Lanc Hospitals took part in a, an NHSI nutrition collaborative. So when we did the NHSI um, project, one of the things that we're going to look at was auditing the uh, malnutrition screening tool, which I'll come on to in a second. Let's go to the next slide. So for this project, 12-month um, project on reducing malnutrition, what we wanted to do was have a really good baseline of the quality of our malnutrition screen in our MUST tool uh, and also measure the food waste because the, the, the MUST is the screening um, at the beginning of a patient's journey in hospital and the food waste is, is, is a good indicator of, of what nutrition is going into that patient. So we felt measuring the two would give us a really good indication of all the things that are going on in the middle because um, there's lots of things that we have to get right to get the food in to the patient um, and that's including the right food at the right time with the right support, the right position, uh, making sure that horrible things like sputum bowls are removed and there's no interruptions with our protective meal times. So actually there's a lot of complexity and by starting to measure these two things we, we were going to get a good indication of, of what we needed to improve. So for the MUST quality audit, um, just to give you a little indication of this, we, we saw lots of good examples of MUST being completed well, um, but there were things that we picked up on that we could do differently. So this patient is the patient, same patient, had the risk assessment done on three occasions. They came in on the 25th of December, poor things on Christmas Day last year. Um, when they came in, their current weight, actual weight, was taken at 60.1 kilograms. And uh, then the, a week later, they were estimated, um, and they estimated them at 65 kilograms. And then they weighed again at 57.9. So actually, what really happened is this patient lost weight. We've lost Tracy again, so I think I'll just I'll continue with her slides for now, and Tracy will will join us when she can uh, when she can get back online. Um, so just picking up from where Tracy was. 
um, she, she suggested that with they find out was with other trusts that there was a variation on how well the must screening was completed in general across the trusts. And as you can see on the slide, the fact that one of these weights was estimated um, did really mean that that pay was kind of overlooked at a time when they were particularly at risk. And there was uh, potentially a week loss then when uh, that patient could have had had support that they weren't receiving because of this estimated waste. So this is just an example and to give everyone a flavour of one of the issues and the over-reliance on estimated weights. So when their 12-month improvement project, they, the aim of the project is to um, really to understand the current picture uh, as, a, as a starting point uh, and the aim overall is to reduce malnutrition in hospital and how are they going to, to do this well well that audit uh, for example will include um, looking at the measuring equipment and uh, that measuring equipment making sure that it's calibrated that every ward has access to the right equipment and that everyone is really clear on how to how to use that properly. So Tracy spent some time going to ward management meetings to explain the project and also ask them to complete the audits and to check the equipment. In terms of measuring the food waste, they had received the audits from ourselves but what they needed to understand was this just an issue for the stroke ward? Uh, was food waste any less than the other wards? And what was the waste at other meals during the day? So they have rolled out a broader program across quite a number of wards and across a year to start to measure and to test that. And then testing that change at key points throughout the year, they're going to test that at four key points to understand what changes need to be made to pinpoint particular awards that might be uh, where that might have particularly high levels and to understand what kind of a difference uh, they can make through making small changes. So part of the kind of the launch process and getting staff really engaged and involved, this is a photograph of staff at the launch of the malnutrition and the malnutrition project. So as you might be able to see from the uniforms, it's a great mix of staff that were taking part, including the housekeepers, HCA, nurses, matrons and, and the ward managers. So there was a big commitment to um, to starting that project. So the concerns raised um, by the nurses initially is that I, I don't know whether I'm repeating myself here with Susanna. Um, there's some of the things here that we do a lot of audits already on the wards, and could this be done in the kitchen? Can other professions assist? Um, is it more about waste than patient care? So we had to talk through some of these concerns, and we did get dietitians to go and help on the wards as well. Um, but when we got the results through. Um, and we've started to get the results through now. The, the comments coming back is much more positive um, as people can really see the difference um, and see the impact that, that that's having knowing what the waste is on the wards. And it's really started um, to prompt people to think about what could we can be doing to reduce it now. Um, it's made ward staff very much aware and actually the housekeepers have been brilliant and they they are the ones that know their patients and wards inside out and they are keen to make some changes but I think they felt that they've probably known quite a bit for a while but not had the influence so this this project is about giving them the influence so that they can test out some change on the wards and we can work with catering to put different things in place and then measure it again and see if it's having an impact. Um, so everybody is really engaged. Um, they did say that just you just need to be a bit organised and make sure you have somebody with you doing the writing because you can't give the meals out and do the writing at the same time. Um, so if we move on to the next slide. Um, Yes, so some of the benefits um, that we're seeing by the way that we're recording the data is that we can break it down by the ward um, and see, it, you know, it's not a competition between wards by any means, but we can understand which wards um, the current service doesn't work well for and which wards um, that, that don't have as much waste on there. We can break it down by the meal um, and the meal type, what the, the starter dessert and the main. Um, oh, hi. It's just Anna back again. So again, apologies, but we're, we'll, we'll just move on. So as Tracy was suggesting, that some of the benefits have been that uh, they're able to use the data to look in a bit more depth at waste at ward level by meal type and by service type. Um, they've been able to look at some of the factors involved in saving saving food for later. So that, that 
kind of goes back to one of our recommendations, particularly around the wrapped food. Um, so they've been able to think about good protocols to support with that. They now have a, have a baseline on a number of wards. So that's a great baseline for be, being able to make those improvements. Um, and I think what Tracy and the dietetic team are particularly interested in also is really understanding why patients may not have eaten and this is real-time feedback on that they're being able to look at the patients who um, are nil by mouth and perhaps just getting back to, to eating and understand um, where patients are unwell and the impact that that is having on food weight levels so here we have the next three slides. That's some of the data that's just come through hot off the press from Reese Lanks last week on their first round of pilot audits that they've been doing independently since their Food for Life support. Uh, they've audited five wards uh, over quite a number of different meal times. So this included the stroke ward again, uh, also includes the gynae ward, the rehab ward and subacute wards. And through this, they've been able to drill down uh, into more detail and pull out these statistics per ward, per meal and per service type, for example. You can see here that the uh, the amount of waste has sort of reduced slightly over when you look at it overall compared to the earlier findings from that one ward. So we here we have uh, we have 40 percent wasted of the starter, of the main 41 percent wasted and of the dessert uh, 38 percent wasted. Um, but I think what's also been particularly important for the trust is seeing actually on some of the wards, the waste is much, much higher and on some much lower. So they've been able already to target some improvements um, specific, at specific wards. So as this slide says, you know, food is not nutrition until it's eaten. And it's multifactorial why, why patients do and don't don't eat. So there's one, not a one size fits all solution here and there might be different solutions that work with different wards and with different patients. So obviously it's a mixture of having that monitoring and, and screening in place but it's also making sure that that assistance is there, that the food is appetising in the first place, that there's plenty of encouragement and the right environment to, to support um, good food uh, but also so for patients with specific dietary needs, their, their texture modified meals that are available, the right supplements are available, there's the right um, nutritional content that's being provided to, to patients. And finally, the this quote from Hi Hippocrates is, you know, is a really key one in the healthcare um, setting, particularly where food unfortunately is often, often devalued. It's really let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy feed. But food really is a medicine and it's an important part of patients' treatment and it should be given the same importance really to their medication uh, trolleys that go around. Um, the food trolley should, should have the same importance for all with interests. And Tracy has left her has left her, her details there for anyone to get in touch and I'm hoping she's able to join us for some questions at the end as well. So, so really I, I wanted to say obviously Tracy you, you've been able to come in and out in terms of, of, of hearing your voice but I really wanted to thank you so much for sharing these slides today and for you know in a way being brave enough at East Langs to be to be kind of open and honest and sharing sharing these findings because it is a real challenge unless we really understand the amount of food that's being wasted in the first place. You can't have a kind of open and honest discussion about making that positive change. Um, I think this project is particularly inspiring because in using the lens of malnutrition prevention, it makes a really strong case for this work and it brings together two sides of the coin where you're looking at patient intake and you're also looking at wasted food. Um, so in these initial findings that you've shared today, Tracy, um, I think we're excited to see the progress that's going to happen over the next year as you do your as you continue with your audits. Um, and that's something that we're we're keen to keep sharing with those that are listening today and with through our networks. And thanks about being really honest about the challenges, but also really about the, the clear benefits that are coming through already in the early stages of your project. We just reached the point in the webinar where we've got um, some time for questions. Um, we've got a few questions that have come through the instant messaging. Um, but firstly, Tracy, I wanted to, to ask you, um, how, have you managed to, how have you managed to get staff um, really engaged in this process? 
It is a real challenge in a busy hospital to try and get people to come to meetings, definitely. Um, so we, we started off by going around and meeting with ward managers and giving them an idea of with the importance of, of malnutrition. We, we came, we covered the slides that, um, that you presented around the first audit that you did on B2. Um, and we, you know, we took lots of questions and, and challenges around, around that and we said what we wanted to do. We got the ward managers to view their list of nutrition link nurses um, because we're utilising those um, staff on the wards to be part of this project. We also asked um, whether the, uh, so we also asked them to complete a pledge. So there was a ward manager pledge and there was a, there's a pledge for the participants and it clearly lays out what we're expecting of each, um, each of the staff roles. Uh, and, and I think that's helped. And we're, we're utilizing things other than meetings. So we're, we're, we've got drop-ins and we're going to the ward and we're um, helping them, we're phoning them on the ward, seeing where they're up to rather than just expecting people to come to meetings. Um, I can see a few of the other questions that are coming up on the messaging. Um, shall I answer a few? Or uh, Yes, please, Tracy. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, so, Ian, um, 5535 has <laughs> asked the question, who do you think should take the lead on the project, dietitians or catering managers? I think it has to be both because um, getting... It's, it's, it's in both um, interests really, and nursing as well. So we've we've had executive nursing lead um, supporting this. Um, so the, the more multidisciplinary it is, the better. And, and each person has got different interests in there. So for catering um, cost savings, for example, the nurses want to get nutrition into their patients. Um, dietitians would like food record charts completed more accurately. So there's lots of vested interest in there. So the more, the better. Um, great, great. Thank, thank you for that. Were there any other questions there that you saw Tracy you wanted to pick up on or shall I pick up on a couple? A couple here. Um, Laura is asking why is there such a difference between the amount of waste that the trust report and how much is wasted in practice? I think that's a question for you Susanna. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank, thanks for that question Laura. Yeah, I think um, in, in my own research, I think uh, some of the reasons behind that we might have touched on earlier. Um, well, first of all, there's methodologies. There's so many different methodologies out there for me measuring food waste and actually at Food for Life we don't, don't particularly say that there's one right way to measure food waste. It's what works for, for a particular trust and working with the resources and the capacity that you have within there but actually measuring it and being honest about that is really clear and really, really important. So in some ways kind of wiping the slate clean and being brave enough to kind of look at total amount of food waste um, clear in the face is an important first step. And I think particularly in England where in the past there has been a real focus through Eric on measuring unserved meals, that has tended then to be a bit of an industry standard if you like, that when people talk about wasted food they tend to just talk about um, unserved meals, whereas of course that's, you know, that's only one part of food waste. So what we're trying to do through this work is really open up the conversation to look openly and honestly at all, all types of food waste. So yeah, thank you for that question. Um, we've got a uh, we've got a question, a practical question then from Denise on the cost of the audit package. So that one nine nine five plus VAT, Denise, um, is actually for our for our full support that includes the audit. But we would encourage trusts who are interested in more support to just think flexibly about that because some trusts may have multiple hospitals or may want us to work with them and do multiple audits to understand a broader range across the trust. So. Uh, that's a starting point, but it's very, very flexible. Um, we have a question here, a comment that says, could we perhaps look at other European countries who are leading in the fight of food waste to see how they are dealing with this in hospitals and if we can apply that here in the UK? Okay, um, Dan, that's a great suggestion and we do have uh, we do work a lot with an organisation called Healthcare Without Harm. Uh, we may have Paola uh, listening in today and they are connected, Healthcare Without Harm are connected uh, actually across the world with many different hospitals um, and again uh, quite often pull together webinars looking at best practice in hospital ways. So thank you very much for that suggestion and um, perhaps Paola we can connect later and share some of those, share some of those examples from across the world. Uh, so I can see that Denise has asked an interesting question there. I'll just take a Thank you. 
Thanks. She's, um, Denise is asking, um, what impact is the, what's the difference between cook and freeze and the catering, the, you know, bought in and, and traditional conventional cooking? Um, I can't answer that just yet, Denise, but what we are doing is we have um, one hospital that is on the cook freeze model and one that is has got a, a functioning kitchen that, and, that, and that caters in that way. So um, when we collect our data, we might be able to answer that question um, through uh, Susanna's Food for Life at a later date. So when we start sharing our results and get more through, maybe that's something that we can draw a conclusion on. Thanks very much for that, uh, Tracy. And we've, we've got a comment coming through, a suggestion from Michael Banks. Michael, you've said um, that you think NHS Digital are asking the wrong question around um, on, on Eric. Um, you said this year they asked trust to collect data for unserved food, but they need to ask trust for served food as well. Otherwise, it's impossible to get the cost of unserved food as a percentage of wasted food. So a yeah, re really good comment, Michael. And again, this goes back to methodologies. And I I think, I hope I'm speaking, not speaking out of tone here, but I think in the past, because there's been so much bad press around the cost of unserved meals, um, actually the question was removed from Eric completely for one year. So I would, I'm very glad that the question is now being asked again, but the correct methodology is absolutely crucial. Um, at the minute, NHS uh, improvement are looking at refreshing hospital food standards, and food waste is an element of that, Michael. So um, that's something that we can pick up as a group to um, try and influence the, uh, the the questions and Eric moving forward, so that it's a useful figure that's being collected um, across the across the estate. So we've probably got time for one or two more questions. Um, Adrian, you've you've asked what impacts has the support had on other trusts aside from East Lanks. So yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I probably wanted to just share uh, some work that we did. We did we ran this work about three or four years ago in South Warwickshire, um, and I picked up recently with a team there with Karen Karen Newman who leads on the catering side. Uh, to find out what, what has been happening in the last three or four years since we worked with them. And Karen has probably shared, um, I think quite frankly, some of the some of the same challenges that, that um, Tracy has found early on in the project around around engagement. But actually Karen's done an amazing job of keeping the teams really well motivated. And what's been crucial for them is putting that audit process in place so that they have a constant rotation of audits around their wards and then being really proactive to work with um, work with the wards that have got specific problems and put uh, food reduction um, techniques in place there. Um, they've also moved across to um, using pads to take patient orders. And the overall impact um, Karen shared was that their starting point was around 26%. And three to four years later, so they've managed to reduce their waste down to 10%, which I think is, is phenomenal, you know, fantastic saving. Um, so great to hear uh, of the kind of ongoing work that continues there and of the impact that that's had. Um, so I think we're probably, we're probably done for our questions now, just in terms of looking at the timing. So thanks so much to everyone for questions today. And Tracy, thanks a lot for your contribution to the um, to answering those questions today. You're welcome. I'm so sorry to everyone for all the technical glitches, yeah. but um, we need to sort those out in our trust, clearly. <laughs> That's fine. Oh, I'm just looking on our chat function. Actually, we've just had one, one more that's come in. Um, David has just suggested, could NHS Digital provide hospitals with a software package that could help us all to monitor unserved food waste and possibly plate waste? Okay, David, again, I think what would be really helpful to do with some of these comments actually is feed them um, feed them back into the NHS improvement um, process. And as I say, I sit on that panel as does um, Eleanor from RAP and other representatives across the sector. So if we take away as an action from today that we feed some of these findings back in um, back in from today's webinar, that would be incredibly helpful. 
and we've had a suggestion about why don't we add this to the to the green um, kitchen standard, which is a great suggestion and something that we can look at. And of course, we do that in coordination with it with the carbon trust. So that's a conversation that we can we can pick up going forward. Um, and the yeah, so thanks very much for that. We'll, we'll just um, we're going to draw our webinar to a close now. So we really hope that you find it thought provoking and, and kind of inspired you to think about the changes that you're a trust. And of course, you know, feel free to get in touch with us if there's any way that we can support through our, our packages. So the next steps from us, you, you're going to get an email, everyone that signed up today. And we've got quite a few that signed up but um, weren't able to join. So we will send everyone a link through um, to this recorded webinar today. With it, It's going to be a bit warts and all, but uh, I think we've got a good job. We've done a good job in, in keeping, keeping the flow going. So please do feel free to share that webinar with uh, both internally within your trust if you feel there are people and um, other disciplines or other champions who could really benefit from from kind of listening to listening to this webinar do feel free to share that internally but externally through your own networks and also I'd really encourage people from different disciplines to share it as well so we're really um, recognizing that food waste is a multidisciplinary issue do please get in touch with me if you've got any questions on this webinar or any other suggestions and my email address is on there and if you're interested in our support in general more specific support on food waste or just general if you want to find out more about our support do download a flyer and get in touch with uh, with adrian so finally a really big thanks to everyone who's joined us today and particularly to Tracy and the team at East Lanx and we really look forward to sharing updates from them um, in the next few months ahead and staying in touch with all of our listeners today. So uh, many thanks again and please do stay in touch. Thanks, bye.